Uju, Wago Shindagu, Migazi and Dodem, Gazagasquaji Mekog, and Dunjaba. When there is an act or a pattern of injustice, it is always the victim that brings it to light. This is an unfair burden, but unfortunately, a necessary one. This applies to both individual circumstances and experiences and to the collective historical ones. If somebody cheats on their spouse, they have to get caught and forced to face the pain of their partner before there's a chance at reconciliation or healing. Truth precedes reconciliation. It's the same with historical injustices. The communities subjected to genocide, slavery, or oppression uh, of any kind have to engage the institutions, nations, and so forth that have engineered the oppression and force them to face the pain of the victims. It should not have to be this way, but it is. The victims bear the burden of initiating reconciliation by shining a light on the truth. It's a two-way street though. If reconciliation is to succeed, then the voices of the victims bringing attention to oppression also have to be received by the people, institutions, and nations that were engaged in any kind of oppression dynamic and received with genuine engagement, heartfelt apology, meaningful atonement, and restorative action. The governments of Canada and the United States created residential boarding schools for Indigenous children. And by the way, this happened across countries uh, that were subjected to long-standing colonization, like Australia, for example. And the Indigenous children were pulled out of their families, out of their communities, sent to these schools where they received harsh physical discipline and little nurture. In addition to the emotional and psychological harm that was done through that experience, these schools also subjected children to horrible living conditions where they were you know, subjected to poor nutrition, insufficient health care, insufficient clothing. And as a result, a lot of them died. And in the United States and in Canada, those governments were so overwhelmed trying to scale up their activities to sweep all of the native kids into those schools that they subcontracted a lot of their work to churches. And among them, the Catholic Church stands out as one that ran a lot of the schools. The churches had very similar conditions. Um, poor nutrition, harsh physical discipline and punishment, sometimes killing kids. Many, many children died at the schools and they died from influenza, tuberculosis. They died from physical abuse. And many of the schools in the United States, like Haskell, which is located in Kansas, Carlisle, which is located in Pennsylvania, kept cemeteries for the kids. Many other schools kept cemeteries, and many also did not keep formal cemeteries, but buried children in mass graves. And I don't know if you could imagine sending your kids to school and not getting a body back, or not having religious choice over the kind of send-off that your child would have, but the results were horrific. Horrific for the children who died, horrific for the children who survived, and horrific for their families and communities, deprived of their own children and the children isolated from their support systems and loving families. 
The Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was operating for many years, had a formal finding that the Canadian government engineered genocide. That was the formal finding of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Recently, just over the past few days, there were some delegates from Canadian First Nations who traveled to Rome, received an audience with the Pope, and demanded an apology from the Pope for the role of the Catholic Church in the genocide of Native kids. The Pope did issue an apology, uh, and it probably took a lot for the Pope to do it, but many Native people have had kind of mixed feelings and reactions to the apology. Um, the Pope made a point of speaking about good priests, um, did not acknowledge widespread sexual abuse, um, did not speak comprehensively and forcefully against the deaths of the native kids. However, it was a gesture. Um, many have said it was hollow. It was just designed to buffer the reputation of the Catholic Church um, and shore up their public image rather than to make meaningful atonement. Others have felt differently. I'm of the view that every journey begins with a step. And while this apology was truly incomplete, um, not comprehensive, and has yet to be followed up with meaningful action, the Pope did indicate an interest and willingness to come to Canada this summer to speak to survivors from the residential boarding schools and to talk about what justice might look like. Although we have reasons to be skeptical, I think that these first steps are welcome. And ultimately, um, we need to spend some time processing this most recent development and thinking about what comes next. There is no way around it. The Catholic Church was a co-author of the genocide of Native children. And a few words are not going to wipe that slate clean. However, as the Pope comes to Canada and begins to lean into these conversations and hear from people who have been affected by this history or lived through it, I believe this will broaden the perspective and deepen the understanding of the Pope and other members of the Catholic Church. And while it should not fall upon people from the communities that were victimized by the church's actions to force the conversation and beseech the church for the kinds of actions and apologies that really should have been forthcoming. At the same time, such efforts will generate some action. The Catholic church in many ways is kind of like a great big freight liner and it does not turn on a dime. I bet Pope Francis isn't even the most conservative member of that institution. But at the same time, we are seeing the first emerging shifts in trajectory for that institution. They have a long way to go. And what I'm hopeful about is that the persistent and dignified efforts of those who were persecuted by the church and their families will actually have some effect in getting an even more meaningful response. Things like public apologies can just be window dressing, but they also can be something much more substantive, something that could offer respite and healing for those who were aggrieved by their actions, and even for members of their own faith community who are upset that the church was so horribly out of alignment with its own self-stated values. And there's the possibility of making a positive contribution to healing. Now, at the same time, this is a long road and it won't be simple or easy. But I do think we should support 
those initial efforts, just like when a baby's taking its first few steps, that instead of shouting it down or ignoring it, we should encourage more. That doesn't mean that they are successful marathon runners or that the burdens should all be placed on those who are victimized. But if we lean into that work, there's a chance to influence its trajectory. Frankly, the United States as a country has yet to have the kind of conversations that Canada has had as a country through its truth and reconciliation effort. And although the Canadian government has a long way to go and the Catholic Church has a long way to go, perhaps Canada and the church can also help nudge the United States of America to have some long overdue conversations in the same vein. As I think about this, I have been thinking a lot about my grandmother, Luella Seely, who herself was pulled out of her family as a small child and sent to residential boarding school. She was raised as a Catholic in those boarding schools. Once she returned home, raised her family in Bina on the reservation, my mother had chose a different path in life. And she separated herself from and repudiated the influence of the Catholic Church. Myself, I was never baptized. My siblings weren't. Uh, we were raised in our traditional Ojibwe religious beliefs and practices. And I still walk that walk today. What I do think that we can do with this, you know, my grandmother, who never really abandoned her Catholicism, never got to see this kind of action. And I don't even think she thought she ever would. She passed away just a few months ago at the age of 98. But for other people for whom the integrity of the Catholic Church actually matters, um, it can do something for them. For Native people who have suffered oppression at the hands of the Catholic Church, this has the potential to do some healing for them. And I support all steps toward healing. Truth and reconciliation begins with truth. Thank you. Thanks for watching today. I'm Anton Troyer. Let's keep in touch. I'm active on social media, and my website has lots of information on my books, speaking engagements, resources for the Ojibwe language, teachers, and more. Miigwech.